So my name is Rochelle Rocha and this is Lori Pinnell. <laughs> ah, there we go, great. So we've been pharmacists for about 20 years, we've worked together and we think that the world needs a solution around chronic illness and we think that solution is really tied into food and what we're eating. So we have a traditional pharmacy and it's in this part of the, of the building and then on this part of the building we have a commercial kitchen where we plan to teach people about food and food preparation and also to make available locally available farm fresh products products so either meats or if it's in season and we can get it vegetables from various vegetable farmers so we hope to be a community space where we bring together food and medicine so I worked in a food company for a long time most of my career was in food mass channel and pharmacy and then um, I started learning more about food because so many of the chronic illnesses are tied to your diet and I was raising four kids and I just kept looking at what was coming into our house which was a lot of processed stuff and I thought probably we should do better than this so we started actually farming <laughs> and buying you know animals by that half and then we started raising our own animals things like eggs and chickens and raising things and then um, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and we realized there's a whole around every city there's a whole farming thing going on that most people who live in the city don't realize and when you eat that kind of food it tastes better and it's grown in a better way and the more you learn about the food system and how complicated it is the more you realize the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Health need to talk to each other or we're not going to solve this problem. So, so no this doesn't exist anywhere. I, my husband's a pilot with Air Canada and I've traveled to a lot of places and I haven't seen anything like this anywhere and we thought well we like this town we like the north and we want to be close to our families so we're going to build something new and it's a little bit of a social experiment to see how much do people think that their food is important and we think when someone gets a stent put in and they get on six brand new cardiac medicines that that's a teachable moment and so we don't want people to have to walk through aisles and aisles of junk food to leave the store to go find their journey to healthy food we thought we would put the healthy food in here and have that conversation here when we're dispensing medication. Do you think finding good nutritious food is like particularly a challenge in, in Sudbury? Like we've only been here for a few days and we just wondered, <laughs> like com do you think compared to other cities it's like harder or easier? No, I don't think so. I think, I think every city has a farming community that supports it. And there are, there's enough of a movement popping up everywhere that if you're looking for it, you can find it. Yeah. I think the bigger problem is most people don't know they should be looking for it. Most people don't realize. We all just think that the governments and the corporations and all of this, they've just got our needs taken care of and we just have to show up at the, at the store and buy everything and anything super convenient. And we just haven't thought about it. Nobody's really placed all the dots together, but you guys are medical students. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious, you went to visit a permaculture farm and you've been to the Detroit urban yeah. farm. And so I'm just curious as new medical students, what do you see and why are you interested in food? Um, yeah, I mean, we both obviously could talk a lot about it, but it's definitely, as you mentioned, with chronic illness today, a lot of that is caused by diet, and or a lot of that could be aided by healthier eating and healthier lifestyle choices. But we're also like interested in exploring sort of what we see as being a bit of people are disconnected from their, from their foods and from their communities and it's sort of everything is very pre-packaged and it's easy to just live life without thinking about the impact that your food or that the like the, the places that you frequent without thinking about the impact that it has on your health and how that ties into community as well so for us we're very interested we definitely like for us in Hamilton there are some spots where you can drive around in Hamilton where you won't see a grocery store for like a four kilometer radius or something and you're like yeah. this is for people living here this is tough like yeah. food like food deserts is an issue in different parts of Canada too so it's all like I'm not very sure that in, in Sudbury there's enough grocery stores and all the key centers and the and the road system busing system is pretty good I think yeah. um, we had a business called eat local in Sudbury which was a place for local farm produce to to go it was a, co a food co a cooperative mm -hmm. type of a business venture and it closed about a year and a half ago so what's very thriving in Sudbury right now 
is the farmer's market. So every Saturday morning there's a farmer's market. In the winter time they had it at one of our local malls. And that was really popular and it's a great access point. And there are certainly some CSA models around. One of the things called Click Fork. And you can get into a relationship with a farmer and you can get you know, food either delivered or brought to a convenient place in the city. But as far as a regular retailer there's um, that would focus on making local farm fresh food available, there's not a lot. There's a few small places and there's certainly nothing in the West End, which is where we are in Sudbury today. Mm -hmm. So we hope that we'll fill that niche for the people that are looking for it. And yeah. we're certainly still looking for more farmers to bring stuff to us, but we have a nice complement of things coming. We're not open yet, yeah. <laughs> so we don't have anything fresh here today. A few things that we're featuring is the Birch Lake Abattoir, so that's the Mennonite community lives in Massey. You sort of missed Massey coming from Manitoulin Island to Sudbury. If you go turn left, there's a very large farming community there, a lot of Mennonite families and others. Um, so their meat products are featured in our meat coolers. Our meat is wrapped in paper instead of plastic because we're trying to minimize our environmental footprint. and. You know, it's coming from one cow, so if we tell you that it's the steaks are one inch thick, do you really need to look through clear plastic to understand what you're buying? Mm -hmm. So we've decided to go paper. So we'll see how that goes with the consumer, wrapped in paper, meat, frozen. Yeah. Uh, so we've got lamb, beef, pork, and chicken in our cooler. We're trying to get some local fish in here. So there's a fishery in Georgian Bay, there's a couple. So we're trying to get some local fish. and. Uh, other than that, I mean, we're called Seasons Pharmacy and Culinaria, so we're going to try to promote the season, so you're not going to get everything here all the time. If it's in season, we've got it. Yeah. And if it's not, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> so we have um, a couple things in here that I would like to show you. So we have our sign that says, your fresh produce could be sold here. <laughs> yeah. um, a lot of far small farms they really need to have a direct-to-consumer relationship because that's where they make their most money. But they all end up with overstock. So if we have overstock, if they have overstock, we would like to sell it in the city for them. So that's what these bins are designed for. I have a few dehydrated things in here right now. Um, these are actually, if you just left the, the island, these are the four sacred herbs. Did you learn about this in your trip? Oh yeah. Right? Cedar. Sweet that's tobacco. tobacco. This is sweet grass. This Looks like grass. grass yeah. And this is sage. And um, we're all about food as medicine, so I have a cast iron little frying pan smudge pot. Mm -hmm. um, the other place, well, that's the dispensary where we're going to sell medications from. And down here. So, we're um, featuring these products are Portuguese from a Portuguese supplier, mm -hmm. but if culinary medicine is a thing, then you need to have all these different herbs and spices. So we put them on display in this tiered area to make them more attractive. But mm -hmm. um, if you don't have a huge budget for your food, you know, spending a little bit of money on some aromatic seasonings is going to be a really good way to spice up your life. So Definitely. world seasonings and then local flavors, right? So yeah, we're not merchandised yet for the public. We're a work in progress. Sometime in the next couple of weeks, this will be um, fit for, you know, fit for consumption. But we need to um, teach people, you know, what's in the cooler. So we have things they're wrapped in paper, so you don't really know what they are. So we have to spend a little bit of time telling people how we've organized all of this. And we we're also selling the organ meats, which is not something that you can typically find in most grocery stores. But there's a lot of interesting nutrients in those organ meats. If you learn how to prepare them properly, they can be quite delicious. So we're trying to promote nose to tail. You know, farm to table, nose to tail. That's what we're trying to be all about here. Yeah. So that's it. And we have, um, in our pharmacy, the scope of practice for pharmacists is changing yeah. uh, quite a bit. We'll go to this end. We have two patient consultation areas. Mm -hmm. We're installing uh, privacy drapes so that we can have a little bit more private discussion. I mean, I don't know, most pharmacies we're not designed with the type of practice that pharmacists are having going into the future, which is a lot more consultations, small, uh, not small, but minor ailments, especially in the near future, the scope of practice will be changing. So you can't be having those kinds of conversations in public. You have to have those conversations in private. So we've got 
patient consultation area here and one at the other end with a hand washing sink. So if we're doing vaccinations of any kind, we can wash our hands and we can make sure that everybody's comfortable and in a private area to do that sort of thing. So that's our project. We'll wow. see how it goes. I'm really yeah. excited that you thought it was yeah. worthy of your trip across the province. So yeah, yeah. this yeah. is really my mom's a pharmacist too. So oh is that right? Yeah, oh awesome. Yeah. But you know, she's always worked in Korea. We had a traditional kind of pharmacy. Right. Um, but kind of growing up and seeing the interactions that she has with like the patients that come in. It's like, yeah, pharmacists could be having a lot more of an impact on patients' lives because, you know, they're that encounter and um, there is so much of a like wealth of knowledge yeah. um, to offer than just like dispensing the medicines or just um, talking about the side effects. Well, we kind of have an interesting place in society because we're really accessible. So people come to us a lot and they don't need an appointment. So they just show up and most prescriptions are repetitive. So you see them often. So you can sort of see how someone's doing it over time. You build a relationship with them and then you kind of, you want to take care of them. So then you figure out how to maneuver that healthcare system together with that person. So I think the pharmacists are good generalists and they're, yeah. it's a really important person to have on your healthcare team. Yeah. Absolutely. What kind of... Um Kind of food initiatives or, or things are you planning for the kitchen? So the kitchen right now, um, we're working on rendering pork lard. <laughs> mm, <yeah. laughs> and uh, one of the things we really feel quite strongly about is that if an animal is raised outside and has access to its normal diet, you're going to end up with things like omega-3 fatty acids in your food and other really important nutrients. Omega-3 fatty acids is one and no, I can't think of it. Vitamin D, you know, if you're living outside, you're going to absorb vitamin D, get stored in your fat. So we're trying to take from these animals that were getting harvested, uh, we're trying to take some of those products that are normally considered waste and we're trying to integrate them into our food system again. If you're from Asia, a lot of that food is still in your food system. But in North America, we got rid of all that because that's not really food, but it actually is food. And if you know what to do with it, um, it can be really a blessing in your life. So we're actually today, we're rendering pork lard. We have all the bones from the animals in the freezer, so we'll be making bone broth. So we figure a lot of this stuff, you know, we have this oven and it can just work by itself. You know, I can just put those on a setting and I can brown the bones and then I can mm -hmm. simmer them in that oven for a couple of days, you know, to get the maximum extraction of the nutrients and the, from the cartilage and that. And we're going to freeze those products and we're going to make them available for sale. And we're going to teach people that canola oil, you know, maybe is a good thing. Maybe it's not as good of a thing. Maybe we need to reintroduce animal fats into our diet again. This pork lard, I'm going to do taste tests. Because if I make you a pie with this pork lard and I make you a pie at a tender flake or I buy the frozen pie crust at the grocery store mm -hmm. and we do a blind taste test, I, I know right away which one's going to win. But most people won't know which one's going to win because they've never tasted it. They've never had the opportunity to taste it. Yeah. So we're going to we're going to make bone broth. We're going to render lard. People just don't know. So we're going to just do interesting things here, start a conversation, make yeah. some interesting products available for sale, and yeah. share in a very public way. Because this kitchen, it's a commercial kitchen. It's approved by the local health unit, mm -hmm. and um, they've been working with us to make sure that everything is, you know they understand what our society needs and that's a lot of education around mm -hmm. how to cook what tastes good being healthy should not be you know a punishment it should be a celebration yeah. and, and it is a celebration and yeah. it will be one here mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so what, what was kind of the kind of inflection point where you said like this is something i need to do or, or want to do that's a really good question i mean I had a traveling job for many, many years. I wasn't home very often, and I thought, well, the next iteration of my career is going to be one where I can do what I want. And I love cooking, and I love farming, and I love celebrating other people who do the same thing. And I thought, well, this doesn't exist, and I think people need it. I think people want to be healthier. Who suffers? People are suffering from needless chronic illness. And so where's our solution? There's a lot of solutions and they're disjointed. And I thought, well, I have a skill set in pharmacy. I have a skill set in cooking. I have an understanding of the food system, which I've been studying for at least 10 years. Mm -hmm. A couple of people were really inspirational, a guy named Robert Lustig. He's um, got a viral YouTube video on sugar being uh, 
a very bad poison. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I met people like him and another lady named Joan Ifland who studies food addiction. And I thought, well, if pharmacists are experts in chronic disease, if pharmacists are expert in addictions, you know, from a narcotic point of view and suboxone and methadone programs, and if pharmacists are in communities where people need help, then I can leverage a lot of the skills that I have and I can create something new to stitch together some of that system because what we have is not an individual problem, we have a societal problem, we have a systems problem. And so I'm going to try to influence the system by creating something that gives us a new way of stitching together that information. So here's the social experiment, we'll see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll, see in, we'll see in three years yeah, yeah. what the uptake has been. Yeah, <laughs> You'll have to come back to Sudbury. Yeah, yeah. so do, do you see yourself maybe like partnering with other community initiatives that are doing things like this? Even the, the like food forest that's just down the street, maybe like having a harvesting session and then you come here and you make jam or something like that. That's exactly that right. Great? So Lori and I, as our pet project, we've been participating in the Delky Dozy um, there's a community garden there and also that food forest that you visited mm -hmm. and so in the springtime we've been going and helping them to plant and stuff like that but that's our dream right if the kids could go in the fall and harvest something and walk down the hill because it's really not far yeah. and use our kitchen and we can teach them how to enjoy what's in the garden mm -hmm. so yeah we we really would, would like to partner with as many local non-governmental, non-profit type of, you know, there's a lot of work in Sudbury happening with food literacy and uh, access to foods and the other big place we need to work on is indigenous foods and our wild foods. So there's some big policy changes that need to happen um, trying to get our wild foods into cities because right now there's some, some kind of health and safety concerns around wild foods being harvested and collected but those are really important foods, especially to the Aboriginal populations, but they should be to all of us. Mm -hmm. And we just don't have access to them because we're not taught anything about them, and they're not really allowed to be sold anywhere. So, you know, we have to create spaces where people learn about them and learn how to be identifying them properly and then cooking them. But yeah, the garden is great. Local foods initiatives are great. There's a lot of good work happening. And the nice thing about this is all these shelving units are on wheels, so I can wheel them out of the way and we can watch a movie, mm -hmm. and we yeah. can have an entertainment, you know, and then we can have a Q&A after, we can bring in speakers from the community who are active in different parts of this evolution of learning. Yeah. And so we have a space here that we really think can be a community space and can be a learning space and a health place. So, do you have any like specific plans or strategies for like getting people out, establishing a clientele, getting like the word out there? To, yeah, so plan to, A know. was that big sign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty easy to see if you're traveling west on Definitely, Orange Street. Yeah. And it's been really surprising to us how many people, even though the sign says coming soon, every day three or four people tap on the glass and they want to know what this is because they don't know what a culinary is. Yeah. And they're intrigued about that sign. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, they're intrigued about us. So, so yeah, we, uh, we're entertaining sort of guests at the door most days, trying to get the word out about who we are and what we are. And, you know, when, when nice people like you come with a camera asking questions, we're happy to talk to you. Yeah, <laughs> and, awesome. you know, maybe through your network, you'll find other doctors who will find their practice in the north. And they might, you know, you're always going to have patients who don't want to take pills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to take pills because they don't want to be sick. Nobody wants to be sick. But if they don't want to take pills and they don't change anything in their life, then they're going to be on pills. So it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. But there's that client base who wants to try the alternative method and where can you send them? You know, if you want to, if you want to keep the Western medicine and the, and the pharmaceuticals together on the same page as all the other things, I think we'd be a great place to, to support somebody who wants to try that. Yeah. Yeah. Breaking down the divide. It seems like those two systems are always like very. Well, they're separate. trying to be in competition with each other, and they should work together. And certainly, if you travel to Europe, they are working together a lot more. Mm. There's a lot, a lot more, on the herbal medicine side that's being integrated into regular practice. So, I don't mm. know. I think there's a lot of room for everybody. And yeah. We're excited to see how this works. Yeah. And, uh, I was also just wondering, did you grow up in Sudbury then? I did, we both did. I grew up in a town about half an hour west of Sudbury, mm -hmm. and Lori grew up in the what they call New Sudbury, which is on the, whatever, I'm not sure if you've been that way yet. But yeah, we're both from uh, Sudbury, yeah. Has, what's it been, like, 
have you noticed any changes in the community over the years? We've also been kind of interested just learning about the regreening that happened and like the the different like ecological and environmental things. There's been a big movement in Sudbury because it was a moonscape here. I don't know if you've looked at any pictures of this landscape in the 70s when I grew up. So I, I mm -hmm. grew up in 1970. I was born in 1968. The moon people were here, or maybe even before that. They were here and they were like, there was not vegetation anywhere. It was about the most barren, black, non-vegetative. <laughs> Like, not really pretty. Like, I remember being a kid in school and you would taste sulfur on your tongue if the wind was blowing the right way from the smelter and the, the pollution here was really not very good. Mm -hmm. But the, through a lot of uh, effort of a lot of people, they sprayed a lot of lime and they planted a lot of trees and now it's very beautiful here. I, there's so many lakes and rivers and it's really a beautiful place to be, especially in the summertime. It's hot, you can drive in any direction, hit a different beach or a different diving rock. Yeah. And exactly. uh, there's some really beautiful places up here and the weather's good. Mm -hmm. And you have everything that you could need in this city. It's a great mm -hmm. place to live. Yeah, was that a bit like, did you live in Sudbury for most of your life then? Or? I grew up in Whitefish, that's that little community. Mm -hmm. And I went to U of T for yeah. pharmacy school and then I moved back. So was, that, <laughs> was it a little like, or how did you feel just seeing the change from that moonscape? into like a more green kind of vibrant and like natural. Well it's very community. beautiful mm -hmm. and I really love it and uh, anybody who has a memory of that it's nice to put that memory behind us. Yeah. <laughs> but it also speaks to the resilience of nature doesn't it? it does, like yeah. if you can bounce back a whole ecosystem in a few years of dedicated effort with the right knowledge and information and application of that knowledge and information like it speaks to the resilience of nature. It speaks to the resilience of us. So even though we might have eaten a lot of crap food for a long time and maybe we might be sick, we have the capacity to heal, just like the land has the capacity to heal. So I, I feel it's quite inspirational. Yeah. And I feel it's very hopeful mm -hmm. to live in that example. Yeah, like it's for us, having visited here and seeing it in a, kind of, in a fairly green, like the air is, tastes fresh yeah. and made, like the air the air doesn't seem like it's sulfurous or whatever. No, but like yeah, then, it's not. But then imagining like this place, but just like a barren moonscape with the sulfur winds just seems like, and the fact that it wasn't even that long ago, it seems like such a shocking yeah. transformation. Well, you know, it also speaks, so it speaks to the resiliency of nature and the capacity to heal also speaks to the impact of policy. Yeah. Because a few of the key things that happened in the 70s were like, oh my goodness, we can't have this pollution. So then you know, governments forced corporations to change their, the way they ran their business. They had to put scrubbers in, they had to take the sulfuric acid out of the air before it just went up the stack. So, mm -hmm. I mean, policy change is really important, yeah. right? And, and then if you have the right policies in place, then nature can heal. Mm -hmm. Just like us, this is the kind of conversation that needs to happen around our agriculture, our agriculture and our health policies. Mm -hmm. We need to have some changes made so that people can heal. Yeah. And I think I think the sooner those conversations happen, but it needs young people who are going to be in positions of influence to try to understand this. And all, and all of you younger students, and I have a son who's 19 in university also, and I see great hope in, in the mm -hmm. way you guys are taking a fresh look at things. I think it's been a brilliant move to take some time off from your studies and, you know, instead of talking and talking to listening, you know, and forcing yourselves to do that and being open to where the universe will carry you on your journey. and it blew you in here, so I'm really happy about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We feel sometimes like dandelion seeds just like in the wind, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> floating from place to place. Oh, but aren't you lucky? <laughs> yeah. Yeah.